Real quick before the video starts, I just uploaded a video about one of my favorite movies of the last, like, almost five years now that is starting to get a bunch of theatrical screenings, Dinner in America. So if that sounds interesting, check out my video and see if you're lucky enough to have a screening near you. Bye! Time Cut. So about a month ago, I remember seeing Netflix advertising for a teen slasher called Time Cut, where a girl gets bopped 20 years back to 2003 when a serial killer was active in her town. And I thought, great! I love 2003. I'm totally down for the period pieces of my youth. I wasn't in high school in 2003, but close enough. But then I saw that it wasn't very good, so it kind of dropped off my radar until I saw people comparing it to another time travel teen serial killer slasher that I missed from last year called Totally Killer. So I thought it might be fun to watch both these movies for the first time and figure out which one, if either, is worth your time. Now, unfortunately for Time Cut, a, a lot of people have walked away thinking that it's a ripoff of Totally Killer. But it was actually written and finished filming about a year before Totally Killer started production, Totally Killer just beat them to the release in the latest occurrence of Boy G, aren't these two premises oddly similar for two movies releasing so close together? But a little bit of a spoiler alert for where this video is going. If Time Cut was better, you would not be seeing uh, as many of those ripoff complaints. You'd see a lot more of like, wow, that movie was just like that other one, but better. But before diving in on my thoughts, let's give a little spoiler-free rundown on both. In Time Cut, Lucy ends up back in 2003, the year her older sister was killed by a serial killer who was never caught. So now she's torn between stopping the murders and working worrying about how that might affect her own future. While in Totally Killer, the infamous Sweet 16 killer returns 36 years after his initial spree leading 17-year-old Jamie to travel back to 1987, desperate to stop him. And while neither of these are amazing, Totally Killer is absolutely the stronger of the two. It has a lot more highlights, it actually seems interested in being a semi-effective slasher. I don't know what Netflix was thinking, but the word neutered comes to mind when I think about Time Cut. It's not tense, it's not chilling, which is kind of surprising because because the people involved in making this movie have made effective slasher movies in the past. Like, it's kind of edited in a way that I would be editing a video about a slasher movie to avoid demonetization. Like, I'm not saying it needs to be a bloodbath, but if Pretty Little Liars, Original Sin, Summer School is showing you up, you, you should feel a little bit bad about that. And while there is some rough humor in both, Totally Killer at least feels like it's being more intentional in its era-specific cringe humor for it being eye-roll worthy. Like, they know what they're going for with bits like this. Eddie Royal was such a jerk in high School. He's giving the middle finger. Yeah, to single-use plastic. But there are a couple of bits in Time Cut that did get me. Should I invest in Blackberry? Definitely don't do that. So I think one of the bigger issues with Time Cut is that it's trying to be really sentimental, but it doesn't have enough bite to offset it, and then it doesn't even fully resolve the emotional aspects it, it brought to the table. But before fully diving in, this video is brought to you by you, my lovely Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Thanks for all you do, and if you happen to be new here, feel free to subscribe to the channel for free, or check out one of my other many videos about horror movies. And I promise I'll try to stop doing this. Also, real quick, while I was writing this, I realized that your monster is is now officially available on VOD, and I had a lot of fun with that back at Sundance, so worth checking out. All right, so my plan for this is to kind of start with both of the movie's setups, then just kind of run each of them through to their conclusion before comparing them at the end. Starting with Time Cut in April of 2003, before the final kill at a barn party, and my first thought was, wow, what a bad job they did matching 2003 outfits and vibes. This feels more like someone raided the Hannah Montana and Liz McGuire capsules at Disney. And they know exactly what they're doing because they will make a Hannah Montana joke later, even though that is not not the way the average teen was dressing. I look like Hannah Montana. Who? Like, guys, the OC was in 2003. Pull it together. And that's not me being too nitpicky. Like, DD just came out, and I felt that was a very accurate representation of, like, 2008 and 2009. Honestly, by the end of this movie, the only thing that felt really authentically 2003 is Lucy freaking up at a dial-up tone. Wait, I think I made it angry. What? Relax. Okay, why is just, making that sound? just give is it, it a minute. It's fine. And there's some decent needle drops, but a lot of those songs are, like, popular on TikTok right now, so... I don't know. But this is Summer, who's about to be that final victim of the Sweet Lee killer, and Griffin Gluck here seems to have a little crush on her. So instantly I'm thinking he's the killer, you know, the little nerdy guy got shut down by the girl he likes and wants to go get revenge, but that also feels entirely too sad and obvious, but uh, we'll continue on. So after a quick conversation with someone named Ethan, where Summer mentions missing Emmy, who was the third victim, she ends up getting attacked in the bathroom, and I will say Time Cut totally wins on the killer mask front of things. I, the these just neutral, creepy masks are always the most unsettling. But she gets killed here pretty fast before we cut to 2024 with Lucy, the literal replacement daughter her parents had after Summer's death. And even though they had her to fill that hole in their lives, they don't actually seem that interested in acknowledging her for who she is and letting her live her own independent life.
independent life, but they still won't let her go to her NASA internship because it's out of state. Dad literally just wants her to intern at his own nuclear testing facility, Sonar, instead. So at this point, literally everything in Lucy's life has been overshadowed by a sister she never even knew. But it's while looking around Summer's room that Lucy finds a bunch of hidden notes under the floorboard, including one saying that Summer's going to regret a choice she made signed only by E. Nerdy dude's name is Quinn, so not him. And the popular dude's name is Ethan, but he was talking to her that night completely fine, so doubt it's him too. But Summer specifically told him that she missed Emmy. So maybe her and Emmy had a little bit of a falling out before Emmy was killed and notes from her will have to see. But while they're visiting the memorial site for Summer, Lucy notices a weird energy field in the same barn that Lucy died in and gets zapped back to April 16th, 2003, the day the first murder happened. Making sure to let us know that this thing is powered by something with the sonar logo on it, so maybe her dad's involved with the machine somehow again, we'll see. But that's our setup, Lucy in the past. Let's see how it compares to Totally killer. We start with a podcast host giving a tour about the events that happened 36 years ago when three 16-year-old girls were stabbed 16 times each, one on her 16th birthday, earning the name the Sweet 16 Killer, who, like in Time Cut, was never caught. And much like in the world of Scream, people have started to turn the serial killer outfit into a fairly regular Halloween costume, even though this was something that happened in real life. I don't know about you, but when I think serial killer, I think like at least six people. <laughs> Let's give it up for Angie, who wishes there were more people killed. And immediately the tone of this movie is just landing better. Both have some comedy and sentimentality, but I just find Totally Killer juggles it all better with the tone and the comedy and actually still being a good slasher, while Time Cut gets just way too sentimental to be an effective horror because it doesn't have enough tragedy or misery to balance it out. I think Mike Flanagan is the one person who has that really dialed in because he is totally willing to ruin your emotional life for that sincerity. With Totally Killer, it lets a little bit of that sentimentality come in when it's needed, but has no problem undercutting it with horror or some humor. And I wish I told her that I loved her more. Hey, I'm saying this as a friend, but nobody wants to hear you talk about how much you love your mom, okay? Okay. But this is 17-year-old Jamie. Her parents went to school with the kids who ended up killed, so they're a bit oversensitive about her going places, especially around Halloween when the murder has happened. And Kiernan Shipka is pulling off the bratty teenage asshole perfectly here. Like, even I am starting to feel bad for her parents. When you sit in the back like I'm an Uber driver, it kind of hurts my feelings. But while her dad is taking her to a concert and her mom's doing the Halloween stuff, someone shows up dressed as the killer, except this time it is the killer, either back after all these years or someone just looking to pull off a copycat job. And Pam here puts up an amazing fight before ultimately being stabbed 16 times, leaving her there for trick-or-treaters to find. Okay, Z, now we've got a slasher. Now we've got a horrific setup. She just lost her mom after telling her to get over the killings. That is gonna weigh on her. I shouldn't be this excited, I'm so sorry. So after a little bit of an explosion on the sheriff out of Jamie who thinks her father is guilty, Chris Dubasage, the podcast guy, son of renowned local reporter, starts sniffing around. Apparently he'd been texting Jamie's mom before her death because they were two of the last people who actually cared about catching the killer. And he was apparently the only person who knew that her mom got a letter all those years ago that just said, you're next. Which is a great movie, by the way. I'd actually recommend that one over both of these. Completely different premises. Back to this. A bit sketched that he's the only one who knows about this letter, but before much more can come from it, Jamie ends up attacked by the killer while at the boardwalk where her friend was conveniently working on a photo booth time machine, which is actually its own movie on Netflix. But either way, somehow the knife hitting the console adds an extra layer of conductivity and she gets bought back to 1987, which is where her friend had it programmed in case she'd want to go back and catch the killer. I probably would have just set it back for a couple days before the mom died so you could figure out that part less chances to mess up a timeline there. But I have to say, I adored Amelia's reaction when the killer shows up. Help! Somebody help! help! It's just the perfect tone of just like the panicked screaming in place. It's so good. So no surprise in terms of those setups and being sent to the past, I'm giving Totally Killer the edge. I was really into the movie up to this point. Time Cut was honestly a struggle to keep myself engaged for the first little bit of this movie. But let's jump back in with Lucy and ride out to the end of Time Cut before we hop back over to Totally Killer. Why did I just separate the intros? I don't know. That's what my ADHD brain felt like doing today. And again, I really just immediately have to explain how wrong 2003 feels like she immediately makes her way to the high school 
to try to find people. And I think I finally figured out how I want to describe it. It's like if a school today was having a 2003 throwback day and these people are just finding anything that feels remotely of the era that wasn't still common today and just stacking it all on at the same time. My biggest thing that I want to call BS on, and you'll have to let me know, maybe you may, I don't know if America was different, but uh, I want to call BS on multiple OG iPods being around. This is like a small town, doesn't seem like there's a lot of money around. iPods were expensive and really just not something in the public eye yet. Nick CDs were still absolutely king and yeah, there's some CD Walkmans bopping around, but it's like they knew the iPod came out and just decided that some students should have it, which I just can only imagine was common at like larger, richer schools, not just like casual small towns. Like not a single AOL or MSN messenger in sight, but we got people walking around with iPods, okay. I don't know, maybe Canada is different, but I was legitimately one of the first people to have like an iPod photo in 2005 and I got it with like months of saving up my pretzel maker money and babysitting cash. But the Halloween scene ripping in with So Yesterday by Hilary Duff really works considering all of these outfits look like they're Disney for Hilary or Miley, so that really worked for me. Anyways, Lucy knows that one of her current teachers was already teaching at the time of the murder, so she goes to ask him about time travel, which Quinn here seems super interested in, so we're just getting another little notch up in my brain for his his guilt meter, especially when you find out that he's frequently on the receiving end of some bullying and is supposed to be this year's river hazing until Lucy stops it. Ooh, I wonder if that kicks off a ripple effect. If that was supposed to happen and she stopped it, that's a timeline right there. At my school, everybody would have taken a video and you would have been viral on Twitter. See, I, I get that they wanted to try to sprinkle in some modern stuff, but I just don't think she would have said that, but okay, that's fine. She pretty quickly lets him in on being from the future thing and he believes it after seeing everything an iPhone can do, which is fair. And they do bring the time machine back to his garage and realize they need this canister from Sonar to get her back home. So her current plan is to go to her old house and steal her dad's key card. Which in terms of Grand Ripple potential, terrible idea. Like she's already met her dead sister that she shouldn't know, who as expected seems to have had a falling out with Emmy here. You made your choice. Please leave me alone. So feeling pretty good about the letter being from her, so she's definitely not the killer considering she was the third victim. But whatever ripple effects might happen, directly interacting with her parents actually causes Lucy a great amount of pain because she sees how much closer they are to Summer. They're more warm and inviting to her as a friend of Summer's than when she's their own kid. Brutal. Good inclusion, good way to set this movie apart, doesn't ever really do anything with it. So the main struggle that Lucy is having while trying to get back home is whether or not she should be trying to stop the murders while she's here. Quinn's made it pretty clear that any interference from her in the past could completely damage the future, but after getting closer to Summer, she feels like she has to try to help. So she razor scooters her way to the mall and they make sure to show us Ethan, but they've also already showed us that the killer is in the store with Brian and Fowl, so it can't be Ethan unless there are two killers, which is always a possibility. Summer's mom did always think Ethan was involved. So she's too late to save Brian, who ends up slashed with a broken CD. A classic, incredible, love that. And even though they do get there in time to help Val, it doesn't work. She still ends up killed by having her head slammed into an escalator. And honestly, the only thing Lucy's managed to achieve is getting the security guard killed on top of that. Damn, I wonder if there's gonna be a new ripple effect where like that security guard's kid like somehow finds out what happens and then he's out for revenge. Anyways, it's after these initial murders that they fill Summer in on the time traveling sister thing and Lucy lies about her being a victim and just says that she's happy with a husband, which Summer did not seem pleased about. So it's around here I started wondering if her and Emmy were maybe a thing and maybe Summer wasn't quite ready to commit or be open about it, leading to that letter and Emmy not talking to her. But because Emmy's on deck to die next, both literally and figuratively, she's currently working on a boat museum, Summer is hell-bent on making sure it doesn't happen. And because Quinn definitely has unrequited feelings for Summer, suddenly he's abandoning his whole, no, we can't interfere. We have to let the murders happen for the future. And is totally on board to help Summer save Emmy. And I do really hope they manage to save her. She's listening to Avril Lavigne. And thankfully they do manage to save her just before she gets stabbed. There should have been more tension in this scene. I don't think they handled it very well, but whatever, there's the future completely altered. But seemingly the biggest issue for the future is going to come from Summer. If they stop Summer's murder, there is no reason for them to try so hard to have Lucy because she is literally a replacement child. So depending on the time travel rules this is deciding to follow, 
oh, she can save Summer and then instantly disappear or she can go back to her timeline and just not exist. Like she'll physically be there, but there'll be no memory or record or recollection that she ever existed. Which Quinn, now that he knows that Summer is the third victim, thinks is super selfish of her to even be thinking about. When again, he was the one who was all gung-ho on letting the murders happen. Again, because he's super into Summer. Further confirmed by Lucy finding the letter he was trying to give her at the beginning of the movie, which is a full-on love confession. Which to me also adds more points for Quinn being the killer. Because obviously Summer's not gonna reciprocate. Because yes, the movie has now officially confirmed that Summer and Emmy are a thing, but Summer was too afraid to come out and that's what's caused the, the rift between them. So Summer's gay, sorry Quinn. But it's after this that Lucy finally tells Summer that she's supposed to be the final victim and Summer actually understands the struggle better than Quinn because she doesn't want Lucy to disappear either. So they both end up trying to save the other. Summer goes to the barn party, makes sure everyone knows her feelings for Emmy and prepares to sacrifice herself. While Quinn and Lucy are trying to get the antimatter from Sonar because apparently one key card will just get you anything you need at this company, even something as intense as antimatter. But it turns out that the killer might also be from the future, which shocker, you know, someone had to have made that time machine that she stumbled on and had it set back for this date specifically. And whoever it is has already stolen some of the antimatter and clearly plans to do the last murder and then jump back into the future. And I don't know about you guys, but this Quinn guy sure does seem awful smart. Seems like someone who could maybe potentially be making a, a, a time machine in the future. So they rush to the party to find Summer, save her just before she can sacrifice herself, and the killer reveals himself to, of course, be Quinn from the future. I really thought he had to be a fake out because of how odd they made it right from the beginning, but my God, they really just went in the most obvious direction. And current Quinn is just like, hey, I promise I won't end up like that. You can trust me. But my guy, you did turn out like that guy because some people threw you in a river, which didn't happen in this timeline anymore. And then the girl rejected you. But because you didn't have any interest in killing the people who actively bullied you, I feel like the rejection is the much bigger part of this because you killed the girl who rejected you because she's gay and all of her closest friends. Well, he walked away thinking she shut him down down because he was pathetic, but he then stewed on that for over 20 years and was still angry enough to go back in time and kill her? Fucking loser. Sorry, man, I really just don't think someone preventing you from being thrown in a river was gonna stop you snapping over some other heartache or minor inconvenience and setback, Jesus. So they're just gonna go on being this guy's friend because, yeah, it's cool, you know, he has Lucy now, he's no need to be hung up on Summer. Again, I get that she was kind of using him to help with homework sometimes and she wasn't always sticking up for him, but murder? And murder after 20 years of being able to think, you know, maybe I should just calm down about this. <laughs> Whatever, Lucy Bob's killer Quinn back to the present with her and beats him with an electric charger the modern way before ultimately having to stab him in the chest. So it's all over, except it's not. She takes the antimatter he stole and uses it to go back to 2003. Trying to pull an Indiana Jones vibe and just stay in the past because she feels she belongs there more. And tragically, while she didn't disappear because the parents on that timeline wouldn't ever have her because because Summer didn't die, they have no idea who she is. But yeah, sure, happily ever after back in 2003 where she still gets her NASA internship, which is now just like 20 year old research that I'm sure she'd already know, but yeah, sure, fine. Hope she gets the ID and birth certificate stuff settled and remembers when and what companies to invest in. So yeah, it's pretty lame overall. It's barely a slasher for something that's like so interested in throwing in all this like wholesome sentimentality and like her trying to learn where she belongs. It, that really just means she's running away from everything she's ever known and all the problems she had and they don't ever actually fully resolve that uh it's very weird. But before I get my full thoughts on that, let's go through the ending of Totally Killer. So Jamie lands in 1987, and because it's going for more humor, it can pull off the more exaggerated period jokes. But to try to stop the murders and save her mom, she tries to get close with the potential victims, which means going to school under the guise of being an exchange student from Prince Edward Island. Sounds made up. It's not. It's a real place. Why was that the first Canadian province that came to mind? I don't know. Is one of the filmmakers a fan of Anne of Green Gables? But she quickly finds all the victims and her mom in gym class, and they are apparently the mean girls of the school, with her mom specifically being the Regina George of the group. They literally call themselves the Mollies after Molly Ringwall. So getting friendly with them isn't exactly working. So she switches gears and tries to connect with her friend's mom, Lauren, who was the one who made the original plans for the time machine. And because nobody else knows about those 
those plans, she actually believes that Jamie has to be from the future. So with her trying to figure out how to get Jamie back to the present, Jamie can just focus on trying to stop the murders. Now at this point, they've had this Damon guy look in her direction menacingly in the past and present, so he's either 100% the killer or more likely a red herring, though, you know, after time cut, who the hell knows? We will get back to him later. But to try to stop the first murder, Jamie and Lauren sneak into Tiffany's birthday party, but much like time cut, Jamie interfering changes how the events play out. Like her realizing that this is the lead singer of her favorite band as a high schooler makes Tiffany think he's way cooler than he is right now and pursues making out with him, which means she's not in the garage to be murdered and ends up somewhere else. And I know she's supposed to be a bitch, but this is a great line. I don't do blowjobs. You pee out of that thing. But knowing that he's not getting any, Eddie ends up leaving, which leaves Tiffany open to the killer, and by the time Jamie gets there, she's dead and the killer has escaped. The only upside is that her mom is now willing to listen to her about the murders, and instead of going with the future explanation, she just tells Pam that she's a psychic. This is my psychic crystal. Looks legit. But even though she now believes her and knows who's dying next and likely where it's gonna happen, Pam just keeps being a dumbass and they end up right where the next murder's gonna happen. Most annoying part of this movie so far. Literally the only thing she does seem to take to heart is when Jamie accidentally lets slip that Pam's supposed to end up with her dad, Blake, who she accidentally thought was hot for a minute. But they're not supposed to get together till college, so potentially an entirely new issue popping up here, though the movie does immediately clarify that Jamie wouldn't disappear if her parents don't get together. She just exists in a world that has no memory of her, like in time cut. Goody. But something that Totally Killer does that I really enjoy is that it'll actually bring us back to moments in the present. So Amelia trying to tell people that Jamie got sent back in time, which obviously no one believes, except maybe the podcast dude who's clearly just looking for anything to make his story better. And the time travel is being confirmed every time Jamie does something. Like just by having Tiffany hook up with Eddie and changing where she dies means that he's no longer the lead singer of Killer Instinct. He's now much more emo a waterbed away because she died on a waterbed and he was a waterbed away from death. <laughs> so good. And that's created another Mandela effect because podcast dude knows that he specifically wrote that Tiffany died in a garage, but now it's saying she died in her parents' bedroom. And the biggest irrefutable piece of evidence is that he was at that party, took a picture, and Jamie's in that picture proving that she's back in time and that this note from the crime scene was a message to Amelia on how she got the time machine to work. So they're well on their way to help from the present, but back in the past, this is where we find out that Damon, the guy that's giving creepy looks, had a sister that died last year. I'm sure that they'll mentioned something in the yearbook. They did last year when Fat Trish died. Who's Fat Trish? Also, you can't call her that. Apparently it was a drunk driving incident, but this guy clearly has some anger issues, so maybe he started going after people that bullied her. We'll have to see. But whatever, as mentioned, they still somehow end up at the cabin in the woods. What is this? My parents' condo! No, this is not a condo! And again, no one listening to her, not even Pam, when she knows someone's supposed to get murdered, and it's not till later in the night that she's randomly just like, oh my god, Marissa's supposed to be killed here! And this is where the movie started losing me a little bit. Like, you can get away with a lot with this kind of tone, but these teens are infuriating beyond all belief. So it's really just losing any impending tension in a really great set piece because I'm just so annoyed. And of course, the killer shows up, but again, because Jamie's trying to stop it from happening, it changes to Heather being stabbed instead of Marissa before it starts this whole scuffle and Blake manages to scare him off. So again, no luck stopping the murder, just shifting them around, but Jamie thinks she's got it taken care of because she got the killer's DNA. But DNA testing really just started in 1986, so there's absolutely no database and a small town cop definitely isn't equipped for that. So now Jamie's just really set on trying to find the killer, starting with Damon, but ultimately doesn't think it's him and also doesn't think it's Eddie, who is the current suspect as the last person to see her alive. You told me all about that night. You laughed as soon as she said she doesn't do blowjobs. Maybe if she did do blowjobs, she'd still be alive. Let's not make that the lesson. <laughs> it's so goofy and fun. But then Doug, the nerdy guy who also got bullied at Tiffany's party, says something to make me wonder if he might be involved. I took karate for eight years. You ever played Death Wish 3? When you kill someone, they explode into pink mist. <laughs> That's a little bit intense for casual conversation, but oh well. But with no new killer lead and Lauren figuring out how to use one of the rides to get Jamie back home, they head to the boardwalk on Halloween night to try and stop the final murder before sending her back. And this further starts to alter podcast dude's memories. Like he now suddenly remembers that Marissa walks by him, who should have been dead at this point and that the killer was following her. But then he just kind of gets this weird look on his face when he realizes that Amelia's fixed the time machine. But back in the past, they do actually manage to stop the killer and it was in fact Doug, who was apparently dating Trish last year and knows that the reason why she got so drunk the night she died was because Tiffany, Heather, and Marissa had all ganged up on her about a rumor that she had slept with the gym teacher. So she ended up so upset that she tried to drive home and died, so Doug wanted revenge for all their bullying. But the one thing that doesn't add up here, Jamie's mom, Pam,
Pam wasn't there that night, so why was she killed 35 years later? And that's because it was a copycat killer who pops up in that moment to kill Marissa. And while it sucks that she died after she thought she was safe, it was a hilarious choice to have her pop off the attack alarm after her neck was slit. The second you see him, press this. <laughs> So who stood to gain the most of the killings picked back up and lose the most if they never happened at all? Podcast guy. My mom never got a note in her locker in 1987. It's hard to sustain interest in three kills 35 years ago. So we ended up killing Pam so we could continue the story and his own legacy, which is so messed up, and then bought back in time to make sure all the original girls still died too. Then he also kills his own father for good measure because apparently he resents him for being neglected for his dad's career as a child. But now he can go back to the present, not live under the shadow of his father, and have total control over the Sweet 16 killer's legacy and turn him into the ultimate boogeyman. Before Jamie obviously gets the upper hand, shoots him with a nail gun, and he disintegrates. <laughs> Best. And just like that, she's back in the present where her mom's still alive, but uh, she accidentally got her parents together earlier than intended, so she now has an older brother whose name is Jamie, and she's now Colette. So yeah, that that's all pretty weird, but I, I guess that's better than the alternative. Still a little bit too cushy on that ending, but I'll take it because it was at least more entertaining consistently when compared to Time Kill, and it actually committed to some slasher things, but you know, nothing about it is particularly standout. But let's wrap up on a little bit of comparisons. Again, we're giving the mask the time kill. I know it's a small thing, but the, the killer looks more menacing in time kill. In terms of time travel, neither one is particularly interested in being overly accurate with it. I do think Totally Killer uses the time travel premise in a more interesting way, especially when it comes to the killers. And I'll be honest, I'm not really looking to like teen slashers to have like a super compelling and accurate representation of time travel. When ranking the killers themselves outside the mask, Totally Killer takes it again. The motivation for why each killer is doing what they're doing makes way more sense compared to time cut, where it's like some incel temper tantrum held close for 20 years. And even if they do claim they're more interested in it stemming from the bullying, they didn't handle that well either. So we're going with the, the, the temper tantrum. Totally Killer also takes the win for being more effective in his genre while it does get annoying in the middle with no one listening. It's still more interested in actually being a thriller where Time Cut doesn't manage to maintain any tension and honestly feels like it was edited down from an original cut to make it a weaker horror movie. Totally Killer also gets the better set pieces to work with. The boat in Time Cut was very cool, but I don't think they used it very effectively, where Totally Killer gets three distinct classic slasher locations, and I appreciate that a lot. Even with Time Cut trying to do its own thing with her being this, like, replacement child, it doesn't even follow through on that plot point effectively, and they handle Jamie regretting being so mean to her mom better in Totally Killer. Time Cut really needed Lucy to confront her parents on how they don't see her as an individual, but that would have required Summer dying, and the movie just wasn't willing to let that happen. So they just get written out for her to hide away in 2003. It's very weird. So all Ultimately, no surprise, the winner here, while still being, you know, pretty, pretty average, is totally killer. I just found it more compelling, it uses its premise better, and again, is actually interested in committing to being what the movie set out to be. But let me know what you guys are thinking down below. Did you love these? Did you hate these? Did you fall in similar eras? I know some people really love Totally Killer. I don't know if I've seen people love Time Cut. If you're one of those people that's sick, let me know down below. Maybe some people really relate to that issue with the parents and, and just the idea of being able to kind of grow up and choosing your own family down the line, which I do think this is kind of like an allegory for. I just wish they had like handled some of it better. But that's gonna do it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members for your support. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. All my other social medias are listed down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later. Also, my last video is about a movie that I really enjoyed that finally is getting uh, popularity. Check it out. Bye.